The Databases for Machine Learning and Machine Learning for Databases seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Google and from contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. All right, guys, uh, welcome back. It's another seminar here at Carnegie Mellon University. We're excited today to have Cheng Xi. Uh, he is the co-founder and CEO. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Co-founder and CTO, or sorry, CEO of Lance. Um, they are building a new file format and a query execution engine on top of that to replace Parquet and Orc, which is super fascinating. Uh, so, of course, this is why we invited him to come give a talk about this stuff, because it's it's super relevant these days. So, as always, if you have a question for Chang as he's giving a talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are, and ask your question, and feel free to do this anytime. If you can't unmute yourself, post in chat, and we'll interrupt. And again, we want to do this as the, as we get, as Chang gives the talk. That way, he's not talking to himself for an hour in Zoom. So, Chang, thank you so much for being here. You're right now. You're at MIT, so we appreciate you uh, calling in remotely from there. Uh, it's a, so the floor is yours. Go for it. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. If you have questions, please, um, Andy, please interrupt me because I've got the I've got full screen uh, on screen share, so. I some I won't see the the chat, uh, so feel free to just interrupt me at any time. I'll I'll so, take care of it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, today I want to talk to you about something we've been working on for roughly the past year, um, and that's a new columnar data format uh, called Lance. And so, uh, quickly about myself. Uh, so my name is Chung, a CEO and co-founder of Lance TV, as Andy said. I've been making data science and machine learning tooling for uh, roughly two decades at this point. Uh, I was one of the original um, contributors to the Pandas library you know, way back like 10 years ago, 13 years ago now. Um, you know, and then I was CTO of Datapad uh, with Wes McKinney, and the, the creator of Pandas. I uh, ended up at Cloudera through there. Uh, after that, when I was a VP of engineering at 2B TV, a streaming company, and uh, I basically really got into recommendation systems, ML ops for recommendation systems, and also uh, experimentation. Um, so, you know, why are we, why are we doing this? Uh, I think when Andy invited me to the seminar, it was something I was really excited about because, especially, uh, you know, ever since you know, uh, pandas, I've been really interested in this data and ML uh, and or data science sort of marriage. And especially at Tubi, where I saw a lot of recommendation system, both structured and unstructured data, uh, it was very exciting what do when data, their data systems and their machine learning fits really well together. Uh, the tools that we get are much better and companies actually can be much better run. Um, you know, the, the firsthand experience I had at Tubi was uh, just how much difference uh, a good experimentation platform for machine learning can make for a, a company. Um, I think when I started there, we were maybe running, you know, one experiment per two months or something like that. And I spent two years sort of making the, the data systems and uh, for an analytics and the ML fit well together. And in the end, we, you know, I think uh, and after two years, we had sort of like 30 to 50 experiments um, on at, at all times in the company. And it was amazing to see uh, how much how much faster progress iteration got. However, uh, the problem is that I call this like it requires a lot of couples counseling, uh, both technical and non-technical. So especially now with unstructured data, I think one, you know, scale is off the charts. Data types are definitely weird. Um, workloads are much more complicated than uh, than before. And then, um, you know, I, I, I say vector databases, especially sort of we got we got sucked back in, into, you know, sort of early 2010s. Uh, we'll see what I mean by in a second. So, um, you know, with unstructured data, like it, with tabular data, like a floating point number, right, is four, just four bytes or maybe eight bytes if you got a double. But if you look on the MLDB seminar website, that logo is 145 kilobytes, many, many orders of magnitude uh, larger. So what are you getting is like maybe the row count isn't even that uh, that huge, but you're getting, you know, petabyte scale pretty easily nowadays. Most startup companies, if they're working with unstructured multimodal data, 
very easy to get multi terabyte scale um, for you know for a small team that's already difficult to handle. Um, you know for for certain teams that are that run popular generative AI applications, for example, you know you get like twenty people and you you have like several petabytes of data. Um, so what that means is for your whatever your data system. Uh, is going to be object storage must be front and center, and then all of the you know consistency and performance issues that come with that, right? Uh, in addition, now in uh, in addition to all of the types we're used to in tabular land, right now you have vector embeddings, images, audio, video, point clouds. None of these things really fit into traditional databases. As well, you've got various plugins into like Postgres and others, but none of them like work all that uh, very well at a native level, right? Um, and and most of this is because like databases and traditional formats, as you probably all know, they're not optimized for large blob storage. We're also missing lots of semantic types, which turns out to be very important for building tools on top of these things. Um, if you if you're like BI tool or analytics tool can't uh, tell one binary column as an image versus another binary column as audio. Uh, you're going to be you're going to have to do lots of type checking or or just throw up your hands and in different queries, right? Uh, and then on top of these semantic types, then we're also missing all of these common transforms. Like for images, you might want to um, do shuffle and rotations and add noise and things like that. And uh, it'd be really nice to be able to push those down into kind of the database level to have native support for those. Um, uh, and as, as, a result, as a result of this, like workloads are a lot more complicated, right? So um, Parquet is really uh, not good enough for these things. So um, in EDA for ML, and also debugging, it requires fast random access. So you might do run a filter, and then um, that picks out like 10 random images throughout your data set, and you want to load that up for exploration or just looking at a, a bad case or something like that, right? You need to, to access those across your data set very quickly. Um, and also for training, you require fast shuffling, especially as uh, models get larger. I think folks are finding that you know, within batch shuffling sometimes might not be enough. You might need like global shuffling or something like that. And this also requires fast random access. Um, and, you know, TF records and friends are also not good enough. They're pretty good for training, but like turns out we still need fast OLAP for filtering analytics and all of that, that sort of selects the right data set and feeds it into your GPU. Uh, so we're, all, we're TF records uh, and sort of similar tensor like to overly optimized for, or overly focused on tensor formats uh, tend to be missing this layer, All right? So, and then third is um, reproducibility versioning tracking is even more important in ML uh, where you might need to checkpoint models. You might introduce some new data and find that like mysteriously your model scores are going down. So we need a flexible table format to help uh, track all of that, right? But you don't necessarily want to connect PyTorch to a Hive Metastore just to have access to, to your data set. Um, and the last thing is, you know, um, you know, I think there are, you know, there's something like 20 vector databases nowadays. Um, but if you look across them, I call this, the, you, we find re vector databases a little bit retro. What, what I mean is they look less like full-fledged databases and more like just, um, you know, wrappers around an index, right? Most of them don't offer the data management capabilities of a database or, or you know, storage around that index. It's kind of like uh, a pain for a, a, a SAS B tree index or something like that, right? So, um, you know, once you get the vector results, you don't, you're not going to serve vectors back to users. You're not going to show, oh, th this 1536 dimensional vector is the document you want or the the image that you want. You have to then go somewhere else to actually fetch fetch the thing to actually serve back to your users. Right, this is just kind of an example of why they don't look like full-fledged databases to me. Um, deployment also feels like, you know, sort of early 2010s where, you know, you had like capacity planning for a Hadoop cluster, you're choosing the instance types and you're choosing the, the number of instances. And like, if you kind of look at your index wrong, you have to like, you know, re-index re everything. Um, and lastly, there's no separation of compute and storage. Again, uh, this becomes very, very expensive at scale. I think very early on in uh, this year in generative AI, we uh, we thought that 
we didn't really need scale. Everyone was running around with, you know, 10,000 vectors or, you know, 50,000 vectors. But, um, you know, as people move applications into production and people get serious, we find that uh, embedding volumes are actually becoming much larger. And even if they, it's not maybe a single uh, data set might ha not have huge amounts of vectors, um, they might have lots and lots of small data sets that add up to a large number of vectors. Right, so, um, but certainly, sorry, I don't know why my slides aren't advancing now. Huh. Okay, certainly you don't have to take my word for it. You can take Andy's word for it. Um, so this is a chart that I stole from uh, the recent paper uh, that Andy wrote with Wes, an empirical evaluation of uh, columnar storage formats, right? So if you look at the timings using um, Parquet and Orc, uh, for a vector index search, which is representative of a lot of uh, machine learning workloads because it requires uh, fast random takes, right? The the um, um, the timings are you know very lackluster. Uh, there are some interesting patterns here too, where you know the the comparison between Parquet and Org are flipped on SSD versus um, uh, versus S3, um, and that's kind of in interesting as well. Um, so to solve these problems, we kind of started a project called Lance uh, about mid last year in, in C++, and then we actually rewrote it at the very beginning of this year um, in Rust. So the version that you're looking at is essentially about uh, a little less than a year old, right? So Lance is both a file format uh, that has, you know, .lance files, that is columnar storage that supports both fast scans and fast random random access. Um, and this is your this is our analog for Parquet, but Lance is also a table format. Um, so you can group Lance files together into what we call Lance datasets. Lance datasets has metadata that provides uh, transactions, uh, supports secondary indices um, on top of Lance files, right? And so this is uh, sort of uh, an analog to to Iceberg or a more lightweight version of Iceberg for machine learning. Um, so Lance is, you know, where does it fit in the stack? Lance is uh, a disk format, obviously, because it's an uh, analog to Parquet. Um, our main um, interface into the world is Apache Arrow. And, um, you know, you know, I think given the background of folks here, you guys know Arrow is this sort of open stand for in-memory representations. And partly it's because, you know, it's an easy way for us to integrate into the ecosystem. We started out with just two people, uh, we're now, uh, you know, just just over ten, and maybe like half the maybe half with half the team working on the format. Um, but uh, so uh, resources are constrained, and so with Arrow, it was a lot easier to integrate into the rest of the tooling ecosystem. And then also, it made migration super easy, like converting to Lance data set from other columnar formats is now literally like two lines of code. Um, today, I think. You know, Lance is um, used in a variety of different settings. So we started out in uh, autonomous vehicles where, you know, autonomous vehicles companies are storing like petabyte scale data in Lance uh, to use for large scale data mining. So this would be something like, you know, in uh, the Bay Bridge in San Francisco, there was like a, a accident. Tesla had an accident where the, the algorithm applied the brakes when it wasn't supposed to and caused, uh, I think, like a fatality or something like that. And I think as soon as that happened, you know, every single autonomous vehicles user uh, we were working with, like, panic and said, okay, like, go over, like, the petabytes of data that we have and find all instances where the model did something like that, apply the brakes that it, it wouldn't. Um, and with Lance, it was much easier for them to essentially... Uh, slap like an OLAP style data mining query over these like very deeply nested um, uh, vehicle sensor data, right? And then next was um, we have some users that are using us to essentially be their data lake for generative AI training. So these are multimodal uh, generative AI for like image generation, things like that. So you're looking at, you know, like a petabyte of images um, for training analytics and debugging and also serving in um, uh, like vector search. Right. So this is sort of the last bucket of use cases for Lance today, which is semantic search for both LLMs and traditional recommender systems. Um, and we've, you know, we've been serving like billion embeddings generated per version of the model. Um, 
And uh, we can do this on a single node. Right? And I'll, I'll show you in, in a second later. Uh, and it gives very low latency uh, if you have a fast NVMe drive. <clears throat> All right, so a couple of benchmarks. Um, so this is a sort of a, uh, a more high level benchmark where we use Oxford Pets, which is like a data set with like, you know, maybe like 8,000 really cute cats and dog pictures. And we ran some uh, computer vision focused workloads, like computing the, the label distribution, which is those value counts by class, um, the histogram of the area of the bounding boxes. Right. And then also uh, basically and also to retrieve the inline image um, app based on a filter, right? And, and a row selection. Right. So um the first two are essentially just scans over tabular data. Uh we're pretty much on par with Parquet there uh for these scans. And then, you know, the raw column here is basically just the raw data set, which is image images and and XML uh and text annotations, right? And then uh, the last one here is where you know retrieving the images across um, a whole the whole the whole data set uh, comes into play after the filter, uh, and we are you know here we're about two orders of magnitude faster than Parquet. Uh, we also replicated the benchmarks um, in the in in Andy and Wes's paper. Um, we added lands to it, and so uh, for both scenarios on SSD and S3. Uh, Lance is roughly is at least one order of magnitude faster than the the faster option of the of the two. So here you can't really see it's about two two milliseconds here um, to fetch the data, and then here it's um, I think it's something like it's something like a, a thousand or a few hundred to fetch from from S three. So um, and this is on about a hundred million rows from the Lion five B data set. So we're pretty pretty happy with. Um, how uh, how performant uh, Lance has been, uh, but I think there are lots of new things to do. So, um, Jang, are so, you going to? Hi, this is yeah. uh, Jignesh Patel. Uh, are you going to talk about the root causes for why that was much faster? I know you're de absolutely, yeah. So we're gonna dive in right now. Will you connect to what is the root cause for the performance difference in the previous slide to these techniques, or I don't know if it's gonna be as crisp an answer as that. Um, yeah, so uh, I think so. We'll see. We'll see when we dive in. But I think this is a great question. Uh, so there are a couple of things. Um, uh, there are a couple of things. So one is on the uh, one is on the encoding, right, and how the data is laid out, and especially for for Parquet, uh, it sort of prohib prohibits us from delivering uh, fast random access on Parquet. The I/O plan is also very different um, for Lance versus like a typical scanner for Parquet and Orc, uh, mostly because we want to support large blobs. Um, and then um, the 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 layout, the data set layout and indices don't play into this particular problem. But I think it also it it um, has particularly nice features for uh, for machine learning, as we'll see later. Great, awesome, thank you. Cool. Any other questions before we dive into details? Cool. All right. So let's dig in. Um, so one, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, we we try to design Lance to be good for both large scans and random random point queries, right? And want to support storing large blobs. And there are some um, sort of counterintuitive things uh, that you see in in Lance versus traditional like OLAP and columnar designs. Um, so the so the simple design principles here, right, is we want to make sure we don't scan more data than Parquet or Orc, uh, and then we want to deliver constant time uh, lookup for one row, and then uh, we can amortize any metadata overhead over many lookups, right? And obviously, you know, Parquet was designed what twenty two. Why is it 2010, 2012, or something like that? Right, um, 2011. 2011. That's right. Um, and so, you know, storage storage technologies have changed a lot since then. So we wanted to revise uh, revise a lot of the assumptions around like concurrency, threading, block sizes, and things like that to make you know yeah, more reasonable de uh, defaults too. So the simplest we'll start with is sort of our plain encoder. 
Uh, so this is for your fixed size data types, numeric types, and also uh, embedding vectors and, and tensors, right? So this is pretty simple, uh, constant direct access uh, with the offset computed in flight, uh, you know, pretty easy to support both fast scans and um, uh, and random access. I think the important thing is also to support different tensor layouts. So that, that way, when you pull it out of memory, you don't have to um, do an in-memory transpose uh, before you can feed it feed it into the GPU, All right? And so um, for us, one of the things that's missing from the data set right now is uh, null support for the plane encoder. So the plan is essentially to add this val uh, validity bitmap uh, within uh, within each block, so it doesn't negatively impact our random access performance. Uh, so that's the plane encoder, pretty simple. Right, um, and so next is the binary encoder, where we have variable length um, strings, bytes, and this is where we would store it, like images, point clouds, and things like that. And this is one of the biggest differences between Lance and Parquet. So if you're familiar with how Parquet is laid out, right, you get offset data, offset data, where it's things are interleaved. So you have to read out the whole row group in order to figure out where a single row is, right? And so this is. Um, so the, in the benchmarks where you see Parquet forming bad, performing badly in like random takes and also, uh, you know, fetching 10 images across the data set, this is one of the primary reasons. Um, and it's exact, it's greatly exaggerated if the, if your record size is big, um, you know, I think uh, vector embedding, you know, like open AI embeddings are, I would say like medium size, but like, you know, in, images, for example, are much bigger and point clouds can be like, you know, like, you know, dozens of megabytes, uh, which is in, kind of insane to read out like a uh, thousand or 10,000 of them. Um, did you, cons it, did you consider yeah. putting any like a prefix or uh, almost like a balloon filter or a sketch in the offset array? So like, you know, instead of having to go de you know, dereference the, 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 the offset jump to the location and then, and then look and see if you have a match, like for strings, if you just had like the, you know, the first two characters or something like that, you could store that in a small number of bits and part of the offsets. And at least you get some filtering with how to have to decompress the rest of it. Right, right. Um, yeah, I forgot. I think we we went through a couple of choices on the encoders. Um, I, for, I forget why now we didn't, we didn't end up doing that on top of Parquet. Uh, Cause we, we tried, <laughs> we tried for like months to try to make all this work on, on Parquet, but I'll, I'll, um, if I if I remember, I'll come back to this. Okay, I mean it, it only helps for strings like images. You know, it, it, like you have to see the whole image to figure out what the hell's in it, right? Like, but for strings, you could do this. Yeah, yeah. I think I think likely we were thinking about. I think probably the the images was the reason because we were very focused on like computer vision in the very beginning, so we wanted this encoder to uh, to sort of be be general across these data, data types. Um, and actually, so so yeah. so people, you're not really doing any filtering though in images, right? It's just I want like you do some kind of matching on metadata, you know, with some kind of other uh, column type, and right. then from that you take the offsets and figure, okay, I want I want the the third image in this column, and then you just right. jump you just to figure out where it, where it is, right? Correct. Yeah. Yep. That okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so for Lance, we essentially store the offsets together and the and the data together, right? So you read out uh, for a given block, you read out the offsets all at once, and then um, and that gives you once you have the offsets, you get constant time access, uh, and then uh, basically you you have to um, sort of hold the offsets in memory and sort of amortize that read time. Um, uh, so we haven't well we haven't. Uh, implemented these, but like advanced encodings on the roadmap, right? Run length encodings, um, where you know if you have lots of repeated data, uh, you can you know compress it using this encoding naturally, but also still support fast lookups, um, and then variable encodings uh, where you know each block can each chunk can essentially have a, its own encoding um, done, All right? And so again, uh, we want to have these encodings to support like more compressed data, um, but still support fast lookups. Um, these are these are kind of on the roadmap right now. Um, uh, we'll get to them, you know, maybe like early next year or something like that. Um, okay, so maybe let me take a pause here and maybe let me turn the question back to the audience. 
Like, so uh, we laid out the data differently. And this data, this di difference in data layout allows us to deliver both fast scans and fast point queries. What is the trade-off that we made here? Where's compression? Yep. Yeah, so like it's much harder to it's much harder to implement compression because we can't do we can't uh we can't do like snappy or you know or any other sort of file level compression here. Right. So um the so for us, because we're focused on these like large blob data types, it actually makes sense. So if you if you have a if you have a data type or if you have a data set with like images and things like that your data set size is going to be dominated by that column. And each column, if we're storing the uh, JPEG bytes, for example, that's already compressed at the record level. So then if you're looking at a data set like that, the final data set size isn't all that much different between uh, Lance versus like compressed parquet. Now, if you, if you only have tabular data, uh, then like a compressed parquet will be noticeably smaller than a land data set. Uh, so that, that's basically the trade-off. Um, and it doesn't, like, because of object storage, the additional, I think the additional cost um, isn't huge as long as you're not, like, storing it in, in uh, all of it in NVMe or something like that. Right. But, um, but I think, like, this trade-off will get smaller, hopefully, over time. Uh, when we add more advanced encodings that will help reduce this gap. I don't think we'll ever like completely eliminate it, but um, I think it can be substantially reduced. All right. So, um, you know, there's lots of like de more details about the encodings, but, uh, but in the interest of time, let's talk about uh, the next topic, which is IO execution, right? So, um, the thing that's different about large blobs is that we need late materialization. We'll take a look at that in a second. And then um, for you know modern storage systems, I think it's much easier for us to actually flatten out the I.O. tree for much faster performance. So um, if you look at a query, like if you did on the top right here, right? Select ID timestamp LIDAR cloud from data set where velocity is greater than 10 and tag equals error, limit 10 offset 100 pretty common query that you'll see for in, um, you know, like autonomous vehicles uh, shop. All right. So the, the typical OLAP plan for this is we start at the bottom, you scan all of the predicate and projection columns, and then you run the filter on velocity and tag. You take the limit and offset, and then you project, uh, you select out just the projection columns. Now, the problem here is that LiDAR clouds can be quite large, right? So if you're scanning the LiDAR column in the beginning and then filtering it, Potentially, you're reading out, you know, like you're. I mean, depending. It certainly depends on the selectivity of your filter. But, but in a lot of these instances, you're you're selecting out. You're reading maybe like ten to hundred times more data than you have to, right? So for large blobs and lands, uh, what we do is actually late materialization, where we only scan the um, pred predicate columns, and then we don't take the projection until the very end. Now. Um, this is only possible if your data format supports uh, fast random access because this this take operation at the end is is at sort of a random row IDs across your data set. Um, but uh, typically, this is this is but this is another reason why it's a huge speed up um, for lands versus like parquet or org. I mean, just to be very clear: this late yeah. materialization is a limitation of parquet and org, right? This is. Right. This is the column store stuff from 20 years ago. Right. Not everyone right. does this, but like, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, and then the second is, you know, nowadays people are either storing on like modern NVMEs or object storage, right? So uh, NVMEs nowadays have very deep IO queues. And then, um, and also like object stores can support pretty insane amounts of like parallelism, right? So um, for for us, uh, what we wanna do is try to flatten out that IO tree. So uh, to have as few IO the data dependencies between, between IO calls uh, and instead try to issue um, a large amount of parallel IOs. And this helps us 
sort of really optimize end-to-end performance for a lot of these calls um, like vector search and things like that. All right. Um, and so I think the first two are sort of the, the big pieces in uh, making Lance really fast. And then I think I want to talk about two things that make Lance more interesting and more useful. Uh, one is this uh, layout. Um, and so if you look at a Lance directory, um, it is is laid out in the following way. So we have Lance files, right? So the directory is the table format, right? Data, data subdirectory slash, you know, Lance files. These are all of the partitions in your data. There's a latest.manifest that points to the latest version and all previous versions, your version history are stored in this, um, in these manifests. Um, and then we have a deletion file to support uh, soft deletes and things like that. So the idea is that for each version, um, we have a manifest file that can point to index files, and then it can point to multiple uh, logical fragments, which can be one or more data, actual data files with its own deletion file. So what this allows us to do is uh, kind of like um, uh, Iceberg is to allow appends to columnar data, and, you know, schema evolution to columnar data uh, and things like that. Uh, and it's stored right, uh, right there with the table. Um, this also helps us support really fast time travel, which is very important for uh, machine learning. So it gives us the ability to, you know, you can you know, append data and add remove columns uh, without having to copy the uh, the original data set and then go back in time um, and say, give me uh, the previous version. And, um, you know, judging by the popularity of Iceberg, we know that's an important feature even for tabular data, but for machine learning is actually even more valuable because of the size of your data set, right? So if you got like a petabyte of images, um, you know, you don't, you don't want to have to like copy the whole data set to just run an experiment to add a new column or, you know, if somebody screwed up and you need to roll back the last, you know, 10,000 images of changes or something like that. Um, one thing, and so, yeah, so in Lance format, we use this to also support like row level deletes and updates. One thing that we haven't implemented yet as on the roadmap for, for later, probably like second half of next year is a write, write ahead log, um, that can help us, uh, support like actual real time fast updates for both the data and the index. Um, so yeah, so this is a more, um, this is a more sort of uh, sort of simple visualization of schema evolution, right? So uh, on the right here on the bottom, you see V1. So let's say I wrote, you know, columns C1 and C2 into the data set in the first version, and that got split into three uh, fragments, F1, F2, and F3. And then I'll add a column uh, C3 in, uh, in the second version. And the orange or yellow files are the new column. We only have to write that new column and the, the new manifest version will point to uh, both the new files and the old ones. And same thing for uh, version three, where we both add and drop a column. Uh, we notice that we never have to copy the, the old data. Um, and if we have to roll back in time, like the C3, the column that we dropped is still there. All right. Um, and let me just check if there are any any quick questions before I uh, move on to this last part in, in indices. Yeah, I think we're good. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, Parquet had some mechanisms to, to be extended to support indices, but it didn't seem to like take off uh, all that much. And, you know, as we... So we first tried to to build secondary indices with Parquet, but because of the take limitations, it was never really worth it uh, in terms of performance for us to spend all the effort. Um, and so that was another reason why we designed Lance that way, and and we we could add uh, sort of indices along with the file format um, that actually makes a much better, much bigger difference, right? Because we were in machine learning, um, essentially the first index we built for our um, users was the uh, pro like ANN search index um, uh, and and it's certainly extensible to other index types. So we're working on sc scalar indices now to support fast filtering, right? So that goes with uh, the ANN search. 
um, but it's essentially uh, extensible. And so one of the things that's interesting um, is, you know, I, I think you guys have probably already heard the basics on vector search, so I'm not going to cover it. So what's different about um, Lance is that the Lance index, right? So if you look at the, the bottom right here, right, pretend this vector space is, it represents our index. The index will have pointers to the actual uh, row IDs in the, in the data set so that, you know, when you do the search on the index, you can then go back to the data set and, and select a bunch of columns. Um, and so you're, it's much more flexible in how, you, how, how and what kind of data you can store in a vector database. Um, and also the because of the uh, format, well, we also made the Lance vector index disk backed as well. So right now the scaling sort of limitations for vector databases is having the index in memory um, and the also the inability to do separation of compute and storage is also uh, kind of coming from that same same problem. Um, and so Lance uh, does sort of, re-implements a lot of the uh, same vector algorithms, but making it disk back rather than memory backed. Right? And so this allows us to not just support vector search, but also integrate things like full text in, in de uh, full text index, uh, full text search index, uh, and just plain SQL and you know scalar index indices and things like that. Did you have to do something different for that architecture when you are putting it in NVMe uh, storage or did you, were the algorithms pretty portable or did you have to do something special and build extra structures into the indexing? Um, I think we just had to be careful about uh, about thinking about like laying out the data contiguously, right? Because if we're, if it's disk backed, it means we're reading data off disk a lot more. And so to get, to achieve sort of similar, similar latencies, um, as memory backed indices, we have to be very careful about like parallelization and um, how we read that data and how we part store the index data. But overall, the um, the algorithms remain the same, like whether it's IVF or um, PQ. We haven't implemented HNSW. It's a it's a little bit harder to like to have a disk backed version of that. Um, we do have disk NN, which is is a it's a graph based index. But just different from from HNSW. Thank you. Um, so on top of this, right? Um, you know, uh, you guys are probably sick of hearing about you know different data uh, vector databases already. But on top of this, we're building what's what we call NCB for, for AI retrieval, right? So this is um, so it's a little bit different in that it runs in process, right? So there's no servers to manage. Uh, you just pip install like SQLite or DuckDB. Um, it's it's lightweight, but it's also powerful. So um, you can search like a billion vectors in milliseconds on just on your laptop. Um, and you just need a, as long as you have a big enough hard drive, I guess. Um, and so because of this, we're like at least one order of magnitude less expensive to scale. Um, and because of the columnar format backing, um, it's also way more flexible. So you can do vector search, you can do keyword search, you can run OLAP queries and, and all of that. So-, so um, Digging into that, yeah. uh, that's pretty impressive billion vectors in milliseconds. Are you assuming that the vectors stay in memory in that case? Or is this when you're hitting disk and running at disk speed? Yeah, this is this is when we're hitting disk. Got it. Do you have a so, caching that does something in between or you're purely going into to disk every time you search you search? Uh yeah. So we do we do have we do have some cache. So like parts of the you know, parts of the index can be cached. Like certain uh, certain partitions uh, will be will be cached, and then they'll just get they'll just get get evicted um, based on some caching rules. So that like the memory pressure is actually very low when, when we do these searches. Got in the partitions appear horizontal partitions, right, of the vectors, or is it something else? So the partitions are uh, these are. Right, so these don't require you to actually rewrite the data. So maybe like when I say partition, I don't mean um, I don't mean like like actual like a parquet partition of the data set itself, but I mean like partitions in vector space. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we were storing. So the index is stored along like you know there's an index block for each cluster in the vector space, 
but we it, it doesn't require you to rewrite the data uh, in the in the lands format data set. Just want to show you this like really small thing. All right. Um, hopefully everyone can read the the font size here. So let's say if I import lands db, I pip install it, and I've got like a local file directory that I connect to as the as my you know quote unquote database. Right. So I've got a table here that is, um, you know, one billion. Right. So you know, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a billion vectors. Um, if I, let's say, create, if I just run a uh, search like that. So basically I'm generating a random vector each time and then in a loop, and then I will say, you know, give me the, the top 10 most similar vectors, All right? So if I run that and let's see, Right, so you're looking at roughly three milliseconds per search over a billion vectors, um, with you know pr pretty minimal standard deviation here. Okay. Okay, so in that case, probably yeah. all the data was still sitting in the file system cache, right? It never really kind of hit the disk, perhaps, right? Uh, you. What do you mean? In, in that test that you just ran. Oh, you're you're thinking like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's not doing IOs, perhaps, right? At at that time, it's probably just getting served up from the OS cache layer. Uh, I mean, we can just do one query, I guess. I see. I see. No, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Let it go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there there is some there is some caching going on. So, but like, you know, if we do, let's say, if we just do time, I think that just does it once, right? I think. Right. So, so yeah. So like that first time it's when it's reading the, like the core index and the centroids and everything from memory. Uh, so this is what you're looking at cold. Right. But, but like the amount of data that you have to cache in memory is actually quite small. So here, here's what, here is what it looks like. If I, if I run it once, um, so that first time, cause it needs to hit the disc to read uh, the index and some partitions. So it that first time the cold is substantially slower, but then af after that it becomes much faster. Right. So uh so then like with with disk space, there is also the, like that cold cold star problem uh, of caching things in, in memory or not. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um all right. Okay, so um, you know, roadmap for the data format. Uh, we're currently working on like partition pruning uh, stats, stats-based pruning. Um, so like right now, um, if you you know you can use DuckDB with land, or you can use Lance data data format with DuckDB, um, but the but some of the um, predicate evaluation is still slower than what you would see with uh, like Parquet or, or Delta. Um, because of because of this, um, and also because of other uh, pushdowns, right? So um, you know, with with that, we should have to see substantially faster uh, predicate evaluation performance across the board. Uh, we'll have more complete null support. So we support it for um, variable the binary encoder, uh, but not yet for the fixed width encoder. Um, so that's sort of table stakes, right? And the advanced encodings we talked about earlier, like LRE um and uh variable encoder and also we're thinking about like time series use cases with like delta delta or gorilla compression things like that um you know we're working on scalar indices right now um and then um i think in the in the future we'll be looking at um like things like data compression that can you know things like fsst or something like that can all that can also both compress and support fast lookups uh, and then maybe I should learn how to count, but like uh, last item is, you know, deeper ecosystem integration. So that means like, um, you know, a Spark data, a native Spark data source, or like having, you know, Arrow and Pandas or um, like DuckDB be able to work with Lance data sets natively rather than through um, just rather than through our like Arrow, um, our Arrow interface. Um, you know, lastly, um, I want to just want to say, uh, you know, Lance's, uh, team effort, you know, uh, big thanks to Lay, who 
is my co-founder and sort of the primary designer of the Lance format. Um, and then uh, Will and Weston and Rook and uh, Rob have uh, all been making invaluable contributions to the data set in the past uh, quarter or so. Uh, and also many contr uh, community contributors. Uh, I think Lance format would not be possible uh, without them. All right, uh, so that's that's it for the talk. Um, I I hope uh, I hope it was interesting for you guys, uh, and it wasn't uh, uh, wasn't uh, some you know things that you guys already covered. Uh, would love to get your feedback on the format itself. You can find us on GitHub at lancecb slash lance. Uh, if you're interested in the vector database, it's open source at you know lancecb slash lancecb. And then uh, we put together a bunch of examples called uh, in a repo called VectorDB dash recipes, where you can build like chatbots to multimodal search applications, um, to you know document search and things like that. Right. Um, so yeah, that's it. If you if you want to talk to us, like we're on Twitter and LinkedIn as LandCB, uh, and you can also join our, our Discord for sort of live live support as you're playing around with Lance. Okay. Awesome. I will. Clap on behalf of, of everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, so open to the floor. Anybody has questions? Yeah, I have a question maybe on the workload and then let others go. Are you thinking, I know you're, you, have, you have targeted SQL, targeted vector databases. Do you kind of see applications that stress on both from where you're, from, from the types of things that people are using LandSpeed for? Uh, so we just have to get your thoughts on what are the stress points in the applications that you're seeing? When, when you say stress points, what do you uh, what do you mean specifically? Yeah, like the lidar example you gave, you know, obviously that came in from the IoT style domain, and a lot of the stress point is very large data sets. It seemed like that was a stress point, and mixing lidar cloud data along with other quote unquote metadata and then fast searches that are needed, perhaps in real time. Right. Okay. So here, <laughs> here is really. Um, yeah, so I think it's a great question. And here the stress points are really the complexity in the tool chain. So there it's in two places really. One is um if you look at recent examples from like Llama Index um and, and Lane Chain, they talk about um getting really high quality retrieval by using multiple recaller re, uh, recallers and this could be like you have a vector retrieval recaller full text search recaller and then maybe like a sql recaller and you can combine these results to get much better um retrieval results but uh they but like at the top level um these like top level libraries have to have this like logic of okay, I need to connect to three different data stores, one for each type of recaller. And then I need to figure out which types of queries go to which store and then um, and then fetch the results and somehow like sync them back up together, right? Uh, so whereas with Lance, this just happens in one data store uh, and you don't need to worry about like, uh, you know, parsing the the type of query and trying to figure that out, you can just send it to to LandCB. Uh, so that simplifies things a lot. And then having the data and the metadata next to the the vectors or your index uh, also makes it easier. You know, down the road where you have to like fetch the actual asset assets to to serve back to your users. So I would say like those are the the big stress points there. Thank you. Um, Chris, yeah, I have a quick question. Um, sometimes you need to trial and error with data a lot before you say, okay, that's the data set I really want to deal with going forward. Um, and so there's lots of discussion and some tools start implementing um, branching and merging of the mm -hmm. data themselves. Any plans on, on your side? Uh, so you can, so I think uh, with the versioning system that we have, you it's pretty easy to implement uh, branching already. Um, I've not seen, I've not seen a lot of people that need to like merge data sets, if you will. Like you definitely mm -hmm. want to merge code, but mm -hmm. like merging data sets uh, hasn't been something that like I've seen that people want to do a lot. They definitely want okay. to. Like, branch and, and manage different versions, which you can right. do today with, with Lance versioning. So that, that's sort of, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep.
All right. Someone in the chat is asking, uh, what was the biggest motivation to rewrite in Rust and how did that play out for you? Oh, yeah. Um, so this the biggest motivation was just productivity. Um, and so I think what happened was we started out writing in C++. And then in um, December, we were doing a little bit of a hack project to put together like a demo, uh, a query system demo for um, a like a prospective customer. And uh, we, we were like, hey, it's, you know, it's Christmas. Let's give ourselves a little present. Let's write in Rust. And th that project made us, we had to rewrite maybe like 10% of the read path for Lance to, you know, to hook into the query engine. And we just found like a huge difference in how fast we were able to write in Rust versus C++. Um, so that was number one. And then number two that hooked us was like this uh, Rust safety and that, you know, it was we were a lot more confident to move very quickly in Rust and make re make releases very quickly. Um, uh, and, you know, it, versus like in C++, it was always sort of this like nagging anxiety as, of like, okay, where is the next seg fault going to come from, right? And you don't, you don't, you don't feel, I, I never felt like good about re releasing, releasing new like C++ uh, binaries into, into the world. And we just didn't have enough resources to, like test it um as well as say you know like the the duck db folks have um, awesome. yeah. all right anybody else otherwise I'll, I'll i'll ask more questions all right my first question is what's the encoding scheme you guys are using for the the metadata like i think orc uses uh thrift parquet's protobuf are you guys doing anything special there is it or are you just using awesome no, we're using shelf? protobuf protobuf Got it, yeah. okay and that was just for simplicity or yep for simplicity okay um, yeah and also i think um yeah simplicity and also i think the like schema evolution uh support made it mm -hmm. easier for us to like kind of mod like have quick iterations on the data set data format in the beginning without like breaking old data sets got it okay uh andrew do you have a question no he does not okay um do you do you guys compute any sketches or anything for uh, like images? Like you know, for example, you know, if it's a high res image, compute like a you know a one hundred by one hundred pixel version of it or something like that. At least you potentially do initial filtering based on that, and then decide whether you want to go look at the higher res uh, image. Right. We currently don't do that yet. Um, I I think a lot of those uh, would be a lot of those would be forthcoming after we sort of sort out our like semantic uh semantic type support in the in the format got it and then do you treat the I mean, presumably you're computing zone maps for like the the fixed length data like a summarizations like min max of columns and so forth uh so yeah so so the stats that stats work is ongoing right now so the, the okay. that will be happening yeah and will that be stored within like the header of a of a row group, or are you thinking that's stored as as a supplemental metadata? So there's so there's like page level stats that will be stored in in with the fragment itself, and then like mm -hmm. the the like fragment metadata and the data and, and column metadata will be stored can be stored uh, externally. So that right, so if, for like object storage, it'd be great to have the that metadata. Um, stored elsewhere so that we can scan if more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and th this last one is, is sort of more of a philosophical question. Like, of, of why do you think it's a good idea to store like the vector index with the data? Um, I guess maybe like if if the index if the if the indexes are versioned, then maybe that's okay. But I'm thinking like the use case of oh, I you know I'm, I, I I downloaded the new model of of a hugging face and I want to now create a new you know new embeddings for <clears throat> for all my data mm -hmm. <clears throat> like is is that is it just because everything's all together and and it, therefore it makes it sort of from a software engineering standpoint easier to reason about here's a directory of all the data for it um like yeah so what was sort of the design philosophy behind that the motivation behind that idea right so the so yes yeah, so the index is versioned uh so that if you like if you um 
uh, if you like overwrite the data, if you have a version where you overwrite the data set, that essentially invalidates the the index and you can regenerate it. But you you can still roll back in time. So you have like the you have you can have a consistent index and and data data set state and version. Um, I think certainly having the two go together was ease of ease of use for um, sort of query engines uh, at the at the top level and, and users. Um, and then I think for um, and I think like for us it was uh, we encountered a lot of ML engineers just having a tough time like managing the index separately from the data. And then, you know, having to like sync up two or three different data stores because of that. Um, and it kind of not only like makes their queries a lot slower, so like end to end, but also makes their like pipelines a lot more brittle. Okay, awesome. Um, and then I guess, unless somebody, if, if nobody else has a question, I'll, I'll ask sort of the last one. Like, and actually you've kind of already answered it, but there's a, there's a, you know, I, I would ask like, what are the, what are the things you wish you had that Lance DB or Lance the format had now, but it doesn't have, but you already sort of listed out a, a roadmap. So maybe can you talk about like the big vision? Like, where do you want Lance to be in five years? Oh, that's a, uh, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, so my, my dream would be to make Lance super useful so that in five years, if you are managing uh, lots of multimodal data, uh, be it images to point clouds or videos, and or maybe some mix of like tabular data vectors and and AI data sets. That um, you know, the first thought on your mind would be, okay, I should be using Lance because it's really easy to use. It's sort of integrated into all the systems uh, that you would uh, use on a daily basis, right? And you know, Lance would be, um, of course, like you know, open source and um, you know, hopefully it will be a, it, it'll be a standard where, whether we are collaborating others or merging with other formats, um, I think that would be the dream where we have sort of one replacement for like Parquet and Orc in this new world where data is much more than just tabular. Got it. Okay. And I, actually this one we can cut, but like, I'm actually, like, if, you, if you don't want to say anything publicly, like, what's the business model for this, right? Because it's, it's plumbing, uh, and as you said, like you you want to be hooked in with someone's got a, something on Delta Lake. You can you can suck it in there, or like you know you know if you have stuff on S three, give me the Lance format. Like what's like what are you actually selling? So right now we be we're, so we're working on a hosted service for the the cloud vector database. So that okay. that's one commercialization. Um, but there are um, lots of other applications around like compute and training and visualizations uh, that can be built on top of this kind of infrastructure. 